Today we're out here at Mr. Larry Stevenson's high tunnel and he's getting ready to do apple grafting and he is going to show us his whole process from start to finish on grafting and we're out here to learn from the best. Now, Mr. Larry, you have just got this rootstock in the mm -hmm. mail, and we had just gotten our rootstock in the mail from, mm -hmm. from Willamette, the mm -hmm. same company that you ordered from. Mm -hmm. We put ours in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. just to kind of hold it over till we get back home, till we could do something with mm -hmm. it. How should people be storing the rootstock if they can't get to it and graft to it right away? Well, that will work in the refrigerator, or they don't have to even be that cold. If you got a cool garage, this time of year, uh, mid-March, you know, as long as they stay cool and damp, uh, this stuff, uh, they grow these by the acre, just like a field crop, a row mm -hmm. crop, uh, usually out on the west coast. And this was dug probably with a tractor uh, in a late fall or early winter and probably bundled up and they strap them up in tight bundles like it and they keep them in a damp uh, temperature and uh, uh, humidity control warehouse. So they've been sitting there. And they put them in these boxes. They wrap them usually lightly, like in one layer of plastic. They ship them through the mail. Uh, so you can keep them cool if you're going to graft them immediately. But I'm grafting a lot, uh, several thousand of them. So I'm going to be grafting for a couple of months. So what I do, to me, roots belong in the dirt. And I'm uncomfortable mm -hmm. anytime the roots aren't in the dirt. They'll live in a bucket of water for a couple of days. But I like roots in dirt. So I take these out of the boxes, and I cut that bottom band and leave the top, and I'm putting them in these tubs. These are uh, cattle supplement feed tubs. That's sturdier mm -hmm. than any store-bought pot you can get, and you can get them for free at uh, cotton uh, uh, sale barns and places like okay. that, feed lots. You can get the, that's a great pot. That's more, that's as useful as a five gallon bucket on a homestead. But I, I just plunged that, I emptied that out, and it's just stuck these in here, and I filled them up level with the tops, cover those roots with, with a mixture of mostly sand but a little behind bark in there and I keep them damp. So they're in soil and they will, as long as you keep that damp, they'll live in there for months and months. And when I get ready to graft, I can literally take my time. I'll come out here and get a handful at a time and take them inside and graft them. I'll put them in a bucket of water, take them out, graft them and then put them in another bucket. bucket. And my grafted trees I'll plant or plant out or pot most of them I'll pot but this is the way to keep stuff now we where I'm at we've already hit 80 degree temperatures mm -hmm. is should I be doing this in my climate where I'm a little warmer if you're going to keep them for very long more than just a week or two I would uh, because like I said roots need soil <coughs> I don't like to keep them bare and dry and they come they're usually a little dry after a week of shipping mm-hmm and I so I dump them in some water and then just bed them. This is a good way to do it. And I tell you what works good if you got like a child sandbox, scrape you a trench in there and lay these bundles in there on the side horizontal and just kick a little sand over there and keep okay. it damp. But I like them bedded that. We call this healing in. Yep. Yeah, heal in my things. But see, there's no hurry. It don't matter how hot it gets. As long as I keep these uh, damp, they will live and actually start putting out active root growth in the thing. And I can take them out at my convenience and graft them. And you'll actually start seeing some growth coming yeah, out. Yeah, all of these will leaf out in the next week or two. Because this time, the mulberries and plums are actually leafing out a little bit. And I've got them sorted by size. So this them. is apple seedling. That's apple, yeah. Dem That's apple. There, there you go. Uh, Malus Demusca, they call it. That's quarter inch caliper. I got some of those and I got more, even more on this 3 sixteenths caliper. The, I waited a little bit late uh, to order the stuff and they were sold out of a lot of the quarter inch. Quarter inch is what I'd normally get, but I got a bunch of 3 sixteenths, which is okay because a lot of my rarish apple signs are going to be small diameter anyway. But now that is the thing, when you order rootstock, now March is a time when people want to graft. It's too late to order rootstock. The big rootstock are back in November. Are sold out. You need to order uh, uh, early fall because they're growing this stuff at a field, you know, and they're trying not to grow more than they can sell. So most big rootstock nurseries get sold out by this mm -hmm. time of year. And 
when people, you know. I see people on Facebook groups. Yeah. And like, hey, I need some root Just stock. for root stock. I've you got, can't find it anywhere this I've time got of a, year. You can't find it. They've waited too late, yeah. the novices. And that's an important lesson that you learn. Order your root stock even in summer or midsummer and get it reserved. You can order it that, that far out? Yeah. Yeah, even a year ahead of time, they will okay. reserve uh, stuff for you and deliver it when they have it. Uh, <clears throat> so that's good. So this is, that's apples. Here's some mulberries. Mulberries, that's pears. Corey, that's pear, that's pear. Uh, pyrus. Yeah, communis. Oh, communis. That's your common European pear. I've got a little bit of plum, native plum root stock, what we call a Chickasaw plum. It tends to be thin. That's plum. This is mulberry. Now, will you have a problem grafting down to uh, a little stuff like that? Yes, it's, uh, you would like, you'd like it, quarter inch diameter or between quarter and three six inch is ideal. You know, like pencil size diameter. That's what you can easily cut. If it's bigger than that, it's just a hard piece of wood to cut because all fruit wood is hard. If it's smaller than that, it's harder to graft. I have a bunch of tea tiny little signs for mulberries and plums especially. My sign wood from that NC McKibben are more like toothpick diameter rather mm -hmm. than pencil diameter. And I just do some real tiny little grafting. You know, I can use different techniques when it gets I was kind of wondering because last year I ordered some apple seedling mm -hmm. and it was real small skinny stuff. Mm -hmm. And I decided to grow it out for a year you, and then graft it this year. You can. I'm just doing it commercially. I got to get these things for sale. I would like to, everything I do, I would like to sell them this year. Yeah. That's my goal. Graft them now in March and April. Sell them by the end of the year. Get three or four or five foot of growth out of there and sell them. Yeah. So I can do it. I don't like to, to like these plums, I don't want to plant out 100 plums and pots and tend to them all year. Yeah. That's time and labor. And now that I'm doing it commercially, that matters. Now I'll tell you about persimmon cyanwood. One thing about it, see I can just pluck these out as I want them. Wow, that's some good looking roots. It is some good roots. These are field grown persimmons. Now persimmons, this is characteristic. That's a tiny little sign. I mean, uh, that's tiny little roots. So if you graft here, that's way, that's like three, six, six of But persimmons have this little bowl. That's mm -hmm. characteristic. They have this little bowl right above the root and they have that little taper. And so if you have different size persimmon uh, sign wood, you can actually cut it different lengths all up and down. You can actually go right into the root. You can. And I don't care if uh, the graft union is planted above ground or lower. I'm fine with it if it wants root. So I'm not picky. They're not the the sign is not getting any particular benefit from this just plain old native seedling root stock. So I, you know, I don't care if it roots or not. But that I use that. That's my sweet spot right there. That bulge, and I can mm -hmm. cut different lengths on there to match the sign. The sign and the root stock doesn't have to match perfectly. The cambium layers have to match at least on one side. That's right. But I do a lot of them that are uneven sided. I can't get a perfect match. So I, I'll simplify grafting. You line up the cambium as best you can and you do it at the right time of year. Mm -hmm. And now in the spring when things are starting to actively grow and they want to grow is the right time of year. Now with persimmon, I found out that my highest percentage of take rate is as it's starting to push growth. That's when I like to do my persimmon. Persimmons for me will be last. Persimmons and pawpaws I'll do last. Okay. They need to be uh, grafted uh, after it's leafed a little bit. Okay. And they have at least small size diameter leaf. So it will be the last thing. And they typically are late to come out of dormancy. Persimmons respond to heat units more than other factors like other plants. Apples and pears that come out of dormancy according to the length of the daylight hours and the ground temperature and the angle of a sun and a bunch of mysterious stuff like it. Where persimmons is mostly heat. And I can show you in the high tunnel. I have persimmons last year, tiny little runts that only grew a few inches. Well, I need to get more growth out of them. So I have a little low tunnel structure inside my high tunnel so they're double insulated. And I've had those in there and they're artificially warm so they're already leafing out. So I've got a month head start on Great. the growing season because I need to push more growth to get those persimmons. That's very, very helpful information. I agree. appreciate you sharing Little tricks. That. Grafting is simple. Like I said, line up the cambium layers at the right time of year. You don't need special tools or techniques, but as you... Experience does help, and as you do more and more, you'll pick up a lot of little tricks like that to timing and other things that will help up your percentage. Well, I feel a little bit of a drizzle. You want to take some stuff yeah. in there and get yeah. started? Yeah, let's do. All right. I got pins. I got paraffin M. I got rubber bands. I would.
a little more in-depth things, but if y'all making a video, we might as well include rubber bands, buddy tapes. This is like the exact it. same rubber bands I buy. I Dollar General <laughs> Walmart. Yeah. And you got several knives here too. Several knives, I can show you those. You got one with a budding. Mm -hmm. I love that knife. It's blade's just a little bit too thick and it don't hold the edge. Like, this is my favorite. I've grafted thousands of trees. O'Neill. Open L. Uh, uh, Open L, yeah. I've grafted several thousand trees with that. That is a cheap $15 French pocket knife made to cut open wine bottles. The blade is just uh, happens to be the right thickness. It's got that locking thing. See, turn that, that collar around. That is neat. Look at that. Uh, open out number six. That's cheap carbon steel, but it holds a, a, an edge longer than this $150 pocket knife. A lot of people use open L's. I've seen that open in, the, uh, in the grafting mm -hmm. community. I have one that is I like a, it. Uh, what's the tr traditional maker of the, uh, the grafting knife? Tina. Is Swiss one. That's a real good one. Tina's a good one. That's the A.M. Leonard thing made in Italy. That's a good knife. I got the Vitronox. Vic, yeah, Vitronox. They make the Swiss Army knife. They make a, that's probably the most common one. That's it. Yeah. <coughs> this is my favorite. More and more, I'm going over to the plain uh, interchangeable blade. I tell you what, uh, I thought I could sharpen a knife, and I've sharpened them all my life, but last couple of years, I'm using more of these cheap disposable knives, and I can't get a knife that sharp. Mm -hmm. And having a sharp knife with a thin blade makes up for a lot. It don't matter if it's got a bevel angle. Just being flat out sharp makes up for a lot. It covers now, a lot. I'm going to tell you something. It's hard to beat. I went on Amazon, and I bought the disposable breakaway mm -hmm. blades. I bought 60 of them for $20, mm -hmm. I think. They last long. I probably got a package up here. I bought, uh, I got a package somewhere here. I bought at, uh, uh, not Dollar General, but one of the hardware stores, one of the main hardware chains has them. Uh, yeah, and they last a long time. They, they last quite a long time. I don't know where my little package there is. There it is. There's that disposable breakaway. Where oh, you see the it. The red. Oh, yeah, those yes. cheap. Now, that is a little bit flimsy. I like that metal handle a little bit. That's I, a, I bought the ones that has the bigger blade and the yeah. bigger handle. Yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. Those are all right, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather prefer a just a non-adjustable fixed blade $3 boxing knife like it. That's what I like. just like it. I just like it. And if I'm going for these, I used to make fun of these. Uh, for years, I made fun of these and told people not to use them. They're too flimsy. But this is perfect for cutting a little a whip and a whipping tongue, cutting a little tongue and a whipping tongue, and I'm going back to them. I actually make, I actually use this or this to make my first cut, and then I'll switch to another knife and make a second one, because you need a finer, really thin blade for that tongue. But I like the slightly sturdy ones like that. You so know? what style of graft do you prefer the most? Whip and tongue. Whip and tongue. Whip and tongue is the most common graft. That's what I use uh, from pretty small ones. And I use these tiny little blades to make some tiny, uh, less than one eighth of an inch. I do some toothpick size grafting and you really need a really fine, sharp blade, a thin blade. So I'll use that for pretty small whipping tongues. Uh, whipping tongues, if the root stock and the sign is the same diameter, that's hard to I mean, Cutting, if you just make one cut, that's what you call a splice graft. But if you cut a little tongue in it, that actually doubles the amount of cambial contact you can get. And it kind of holds it together. It, a besides bit holding it together, and it took a while. I did a lot of splice grafts when I started because it took me a few Just years to get that trick. Just cut them and stick them and then wrap them. Yeah, it took me a while to cut that trick of getting tongue. And it's easy to slip, and that is how you cut yourself mm -hmm. repeatedly all the time, cutting that little tongue and a whipping tongue. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and do a couple of graphs. Let's do a normal size, okay. and then let's do the little bitty ones that you're talking oh, about. Oh, okay, we can. So if you want to grab and, a... Uh, oh, let me get some roots. And, um, okay, I do that. For tea tiny ones, like under an eight, I do usually a cleft graft, and okay. I should show that. That's the most simple graft. I know a lot of old-time gra grafters that only use a cleft graft. And I do a lot of cleft grafts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've got some big ones. I don't know if the bark is slipping on these. We can show how to graft a small uh, sign onto a bigger diameter root stock like this. Using a bark? I, using a bark graft. I'll suggest that. Okay, so let me. All right, let's talk about it. So um, what? Okay. you got a couple of different 
uh, size of rootstock mm -hmm. that we're going to do here. And my challenge last year is I ordered some small stuff and I didn't feel comfortable trying to graft to the little bitty stuff. Can we get an, an, um, an example of how we how it's best to graft the really tiny stuff? Yeah, you want to see a regular whipping tongue? I make pretty small ones. I'll show you whipping tongue and I'll show you a bark grafted. Now this is seed grown mulberry root stock from one of the state nurseries and they do not grade it. So you see you get great big whopping ones like that and teeny tiny ones at the same time. Wow, look at that. You got a really yeah. big one there and then you have it's, some, some. They are not graded. Whereas if you order them from a root stock nursery like Willamette, see that's graded all at quarter inch and that'll be closest. Uh, but you get them from state nurseries, they're any size in the rainbow. So ideally you would like the root stock and the sign to match, but you ain't gotta. Uh, people are starting off grafting, uh, that's a big issue to them, trying to match them. I'm, I just pluck them out. I'm pretty good at judging by eye, and I don't have to get an exact match. Because, uh, uh, like I said, you have to have the cambium or the root stock and the sign to match. But they have to match on one side, at least one side. If you, if you don't have any cambium match, at least on one side, there's no chance of it taken. So I try to match the cambium, and even on equal size root stock and sign, I'm really lining up the cambium on one side. I'm always looking at one side of the graph. So here's a mulberry. Mulberries are rooty. I used to not do much root pruning, but I'm gonna pot that, so I cut that off. So you can see, there's a tree. Let's see, let me get my mulberry root stock. And I, when you're grafting, or if you're like a sign exchange or something like that, and you got all these root stock, they got all the sign wood laid out on the table, you got to keep them in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to keep them organized. You cannot mix them together. Once you get a pile of sticks mixed up together, you might as well throw, throw them away. Throw away because you don't know what you got. Now, this is how I store sign wood. See, I cut these off my producing trees. This is what I pruned off. I cut them in the lengths to fit in this one gallon plastic bag and I put a, just a tiny little piece of paper towel in there, damp paper towel, to keep moisture in there. You don't want to get them too wet. I wouldn't put like a whole paper towel, wrap them up in there. They get too wet and if you let your sign wood get too wet, it'll mold. I've had that problem too. I do, and old stuff. Uh, I keep some sign wood up to a year in the refrigerator and most of it molds, 95% of it will mold and be unusable and die, but some of it I, I, is fresh and green. You scratch your bark, it's good a year later. And those are always the ones that were kept a little bit on the green side. Last year, I stored some in bags without the wet paper mm -hmm. towel, and eight months later, they were still good in viable wood. It is drier ones. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fungus is gonna develop if they're very wet, so it is mm -hmm. keep them a little bit dry. And that's why I say just pick off a tiny little pellet corner of a paper towel or newspaper and dampen it just a little bit because kept in the refrigerator and damp you know they stay cool but uh okay here's my sign wood I cut off too many roots I cut it off pretty yeah. close that's the level where you'll plant it so I'm grafting pretty close down uh this situation this is like an eighth of an inch or so this is one I'm zoomed in oh okay this is one where it's good to have this little thin bladed really sharp knife and you start about a half to three quarters of an inch from the end. And you try to do that in one long stroke like that. And you hardly ever do. So I touch it up a little bit. You want a long slant. Can you get that slant? That's important and you want it straight as it can be. All right, that's a splice graph. Now I'm gonna cut my little tongue in there cause I'm gonna do a hoop and tongue. I, I actually made these little thing, uh, thumb protectors. I will slip that over my thing this is where grafters cut themselves. It's all, we cut ourselves repeatedly right here every time when we're trying to cut this tongue in a whipping tongue graft. This little deal here keeps me from cutting myself. And people laugh at this, but they cut themselves every year and I don't. So, and now I'm starting, cut my tongue, I'm starting right above the, the pith of the thing. And all fruit wood is hard. I am not forcing this blade through there. I'm wiggling it back and forth and taking my time. That's really important. If you try to force uh, a knife through the fruit wood, see, like that, it just slip. You will cut yourself without a thumb protector. No big deal. I 
I've done a lot. I still mess up a lot. It's hard to improve. Now, grafting, I want to say, speed does not matter. Uh, unless you're doing it in a com big commercial place where they're keeping count of how many you do an hour, speed is the last thing you worry about. It does not matter how many you do an hour you do. Take your time and try to do everything just perfect. But you see, I've kind of wiggled my blade through there, and that's my whipping tongue. Now, I will try to pick out a mulberry sign that approximately matches it. And that's about the right diameter. Mulberry signs, the, usually the buds are pretty far apart. And for a good graft, you only need two or three buds, which is a piece about as long as your finger. If you use a whole stick like that long, it actually is slower for it to take and slower for it to grow. So you use a very small piece of wood. Like I said, two or three buds is typically what you go for. And I'll do the same thing I did on the rootstock. I'll, and I will, I will take that down to the end. Okay, and I've cut a little whipping tongue in it. Now, I like to wrap all my signs in this product. It's called Parafilm M. That's a laboratory uh, aid. It's made to seal test tubes. It'll come on a roll like this with paper backing. And I just snip off a piece with my scissors. And this is thin, thin plastic. It will stretch just endlessly. And I put my finger on there, and I stretch and stretch and stretch this stuff. Now, you don't have to use Parafilm M to wrap your signs. Uh, more people don't, but I like it, and I do all of them like it, because all that plastic will do is uh, keep moisture in that sign for a couple of extra days, and that'll give you a little bit longer for it to take. So... That's my sign, got a whipping tongue cut in there, covered with paraffin M, and just match those things. I slide them in together. And what I'm really doing is lining up the cambium on both sides. That's T tiny. It matches better on one side than it does the other side. But the one side, you want to get a good match. That's a good looking graph. That, that one looks okay. But see, it <laughs> took me a couple of whittles. If you're really good, you do it in one long stroke. Now, to wrap the graft union, I use this product. This is called Buddy Tape, B-U-D-D-Y, Buddy Tape. It's expensive. This is like $50 or $60 a roll, but I can get about 900 grafts off of that. And the advantage to me is fast. See, it's perforated. It's about one inch by two inch. It's perforated. I can just snatch off a piece of that, and that is just the ideal size to make the graft union. And I'll put, hold my finger, on one side of that, and I'll just wrap and wrap and wrap, and I'm stretching and stretching and stretching that plastic as much as I can. See, over and over and over, stretch it, and this buddy tape and paraffin will both uh, stretch, and you stretch and stretch and stretch, and you don't need to tie it. It's not sticky, but it'll adhere to itself, pretty much. That is a finished graft union. And you don't even have to put any rubber bands on that one. I don't, I'd use rubber bands. Some. Now, this buddy tape will rot away in uh, two or three months, and the buds will bust right through the buddy tape, so it's no problem. But I'm using the buddy tape, I'm not I'm the paraffin M, excuse me. I'm using the paraffin M for that. I'm using a different tape, the buddy tape, for the graft union, because buddy tape takes up to about a year to rot away. I have wrapped the graft union with paraffin M before. It uh, dissolved within about three months and exposed the graft union. So these look very similar, and you can't tell them apart. They're both thin plastic, but the buddy tape is for the graft union because it lasts longer. And you can pull it and get a look, and it holds that union together that a little helps. bit tighter. And that helps. It stretches and stretches and stretches because you want that as tight as you can. Uh, and a lot of times you have you cut a graft union that's less than perfect, and it's not a perfect match, but you stretch it and put pressure on there, and you can actually put draw the sides of those, that graft union together and force them to match. Uh, but that's a pretty good union. Now, I could, if I did not have a good union, if it's on bigger stock, I do this. I use a rubber band a lot of times. You can use rubber. This is like a postal size rubber band. Uh, you can do the grafts just by these. I usually don't, but I use it as additionally. If I did not have a good graft union, I wrap it the same way. Don't tie it at the bottom. Just hold it with your forefinger and, and overlap it. 
and that overlapping once you put pressure on that uh, rubber band that will actually hold it in place with that a lot a rubber band you can stretch and stretch and stretch and you can really put good pressure on the thing and that actually draws the graft union together tight now whenever i uh, i'm using the rubber bands like mm -hmm. this for my graft about six weeks in the sun mm -hmm. that thing will rot and fall off of there and that graft union will have taken mm -hmm. so. and look i put my forefinger there and i just make a simple uh half hitch over that and that's only not just that one half hitch to take and it doesn't come loose. rubber bands uh when you put them out in the sunlight and air they dissolve amazingly fast like yep, you said within weeks. a month yep. so so now this is advantage the buds i don't have to do anything else to this after i plant the buds break right through this paraffin it'll dissolve within a couple of months uh the the rubber band and the buddy tape will last uh, the buddy, rubber bands will fall off in a month. The buddy tape will last three or four months, and that's long enough for that graft union to heal. And so nothing I, will be girdled. Nothing will be girdled. I don't have to take it off or anything. That's finished. Uh, it's finished except for this, and this is tremendously important. Label them right away, no waiting, one tree at a time. Let, put your label on what that is. Grover's best. Rubber Vest Mulberry. And I'm using, this is a temporary tag that I'll put on the thing. This is just common one inch masking tape. I'll put this on temporarily until I make sure the graft union is healed. And then I'll put a more permanent label, plastic label on there. But uh, I'm using this type of pin. This is an all flex tag pin. This stuff, this pin is made for marking on cattle ear tags. So it will last more than a year on plastic or the masking tape. Your regular Sharpie marker will fade out. And every other garden marker I've ever used, Sharpie will fade out within two or three months. And by midsummer, you will have lost your identification on so yourself. So let me ask you this, Larry. I mm -hmm. use a Sharpie paint pen. Mm -hmm. Have you had any experience with that? Yeah, I not yeah, not good experience. I've used a Sharpie uh, paint pen that didn't last much longer than regular Sharpie. And I've used a Sharpie. They make an industrial, supposedly permanent type of uh, Pen, same thing. So, so I don't know He's any Sharpie brands I'm happy with. I've used the Sharpie paint pens before. Where uh, do you find your, your tag pen? Uh, my wife ordered them from Amazon. Okay. Now, I don't know. I think she got those from a pet supply company or like a cow and horse company, a veterinary company. Okay. It, you can get them off Amazon, and they're not real expensive, and they last a long time. But that is a truly permanent marker. So that is, a, that is finished. Pot it up. That is native mulberry rootstock right there, and this is a hybrid uh, between red and white rootstock on there uh, with a tag on it. And like I said, I'll come back and replace these with a, a more permanent tag like that. The uh, I'll talk. I'll show you some more. I love the buddy tape. If you're doing ten trees or just a few for a homeowner, it's not worth the investment for those because I'm doing thousands, so it's worth the convenience of that. This right here is your conventional grafting tape that everybody has used for years and years. It's called floral tape. That's like two or three bucks for a roll. And it is non-sticky tape. It's flat on both sides. This stuff is tough, tough. It doesn't stretch as much. But if you have a graft union uh, that's not good, this is just like the rubber band. You can wrap this around it and puts a lot of pressure on there. And you can pull that graft union together. You can really pull tight on that. And pull as tight as you want without breaking it. Now, I've done bark grafting on, mm -hmm. on trees that I've reworked. Mm -hmm. And to be able to pull that bark back to it, I use electrical tape. Uh, electrical tape or this. Electrical tape is easier because it sticks together. There's been more barks, uh, been more grafts made with electrical tape than anything else. But this is good. Now, the disadvantage of uh, the floral tape or masking tape or uh, electrical tape, you got to go back and cut that off. Yes. Because this will actually girdle and strangle the graft. So I'm doing thousands of them. Uh, it's a huge advantage to me to use the buddy tape because I don't have to take it off. It'll dissolve by itself. This stuff, I would have to go back uh, by midsummer or late summer and cut every bit of this off. So you don't use that as much as. No, much as hardly you ever. Yeah. Hardly ever. Like I said, when I'm grafting onto a bigger piece of wood with. Uh, a bark graph, something like that, and I need some hard pressure. I would use that. Well, great. That was uh, that was a great example of mm -hmm. some fine thin stock. Mm -hmm. Let's. You talked about doing a uh, a bark graft 
where you're using a smaller side okay. on to a, a, yeah. a larger diameter rootstock. Can you show us yeah, that? Yeah, I sure will. Let's see. Now I'm keeping this stuff together carefully. Now, as a side note, I was teaching a grafting class last year, and my scions almost got mixed up. <laughs> uh, I, I, that is the first thing I tell them. Keep uh, it separate. It, when you take it out of a, a bag, you've got to put it back together. In, mm -hmm. in and I see people leaving with unlabeled stuff. They don't know what it is. Once you get all the, they're just sticks. And once you get all those labeled together. Now, see, this is too much paper. Yep. Once you get all that stuff labeled. Uh-oh. Some of that's starting some to Some of that's breaking. Buds. That's a Turnbull pair. Okay, let's see. Now with it starting to push growth like that, mm -hmm. how do you feel about using that? I don't like it. I'd rather have something fully dormant, but I'll use it anyway, and I usually have success. And like I said, a lot of my Cox winter and uh, Anna apple signs, they started uh, budding in January, and I just couldn't get to the things in time to cut them. So I got some that's got small leaves or buds, and I'm usually pu pulling those off. Uh, and I use them. I'd rather have fully dormant stuff, but uh, I can make it work. You don't, you seldom have exactly what you want. So mm -hmm. you'll do a lot of that graft and you make, make, make stuff work. Okay, for sometimes when you have a small sign and you have a big root stock and, and they're not obviously not matching very well, uh, you can use a bark graft. Handy to know. See, now that size wood, when you get to that size of wood, that's hard to cut. Uh, okay, I got this cut off horizontally. I'll simply make a cut about an inch long, cut it all the way down and so you're gonna use to the a, wood. Just, just cut the bark on it. Yep, just cut it straight up. And it's better if, if it was a little bit better later in the year when the bark was slipping. The bark is sticking real tight to it right now. So if that... If that root stock is actively growing, mm -hmm. that bark will just slip right off of that. Yes, and that is for most stuff. Uh, the timing is a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to start grafting too early in the year, but the time to graft is when you see the trees all around you starting to bud out and leaf, and, and that is a time when they want to heal and grow and take off. So I try to work with nature instead of against it. So I don't graft stuff before a season. I wait till stuff is budded out and ready to be grafted. All right, here's a Turnbull pear sign. I don't like it budded out like that. I wish it hasn't, but that's what I got. I have some very low chill apple, mm -hmm. and uh, it's starting to push growth in the refrigerator. Yeah, I have, I have that happen. Uh, that's not uncommon. Uh, I use it. I've never had any bad, spectacular failures using some stuff that's slightly budded out. And, uh, Okay, so I'm gonna make a bark graft. I did the same thing, one long cut, but then I'll go to the back of it and whittle a little toe in there. So you got kind of uneven diameter. Because the yeah. only, the growing part is against the cavium, mm -hmm. which when you pull the bark away, you're placing it against the cavium. But when the bark, you pull it away, there's actually a little bit of cavium stuck to those flaps of the bark, and they will match up on that a little bit. So you actually get, it doesn't look like cambium, but there's a thin layer of cambium right above the wood and underneath the bark, and even when you separate those, uh, it'll still be there. Uh, a bark graft looks rough and crude, but they heal up surprisingly fast. And now, I've got my little wedge shape cut in there. I'll just simply slip that in there. The bark's not slipping. I would like for it to part easier, but that's kind of doing it. And you can see I took it up all the way to the graft union there. That is a small diameter sign on a much bigger diameter rootstock, which looks rough and crude, uh, usually no problem. They take just as well as whip and tongue graft. I'll have to use probably a couple of pieces of tape on this. A graft union, um, it does not really have to be airtight. If you're using a plastic product like this, it will be airtight, but it's not strictly necessary. You just want to keep air, too much air, and uh, bugs and dirt and water from getting into that graft union. But you see this tape, this buddy tape, it will stretch even around an angle like that. And that's another advantage to it. Well, that looks good. So that is a bark graft, and that's what you do. A lot of times you'll have uneven size uh, uh, root stock and sign. And what did I say what that was? That was a Turnbull pair. 
you how that labels so I can show that. Uh huh. Uh. Turn bull. Turn, turn bull. bull. Oh, hard pair. More like a hard cannon pair. I forget its origin. Texas, I think. I won't graft a lot of turn bull because I think it'll be more of a cannon pair than fresh eating pair. But there's another one. Like I said, I'll plant that in the pot and I'll need a bigger pot. This is characteristic of a uh, uh, pear root stock. Pear root. Pears form a bigger tap root with very few fine feeder roots. And it don't look like it support much growth, but I get six or eight feet of growth in a year out of this. They don't oh. really actively blow over during hurricane season either. No, <laughs> pear root as compared to this. All right, and I say that's characteristic of apple root. See yeah. how rooty that is? Yeah. So I, I could dig up a, a, a unknown tree out of the ground and I could tell if that was a different apple and pear. And then you got mulberry roots, which mulberries are excessively rooty almost. So I actually pruned some of the mulberry roots. I used to. I say mulberry is probably the, one of the most vigorous things I it ever worked with. It is a vigorous grower. It uh, will, you Put it near dirt it'll go <laughs> you, you do and you, they will root you can stick the tops of them and so and root and grow your own root stock but uh that's finished all the roots are different i used to never the roots are the heart and soul of a tree you know it's the soil and your roots where every, all growth comes from that so i used to never prune roots and when i'd get something like this if I had a big root system, I'd put it in a big pot but i'm talking to a lot of my nursery friends now and they do a lot of root pruning they cut the roots down uh, to fit their pot that they want to fit in. So this year I will do more uh, root pruning. Is but, this a colonial, uh, colonial type of uh, root stock? No, this is, is this seedling. seedling. This okay. is seedling. I think everything I have will be a uh, uh, seedling. You know, I don't think I have any colonial root stock. It's all be seedling. Okay. But that's it, and that's a second finished graft. You want to? Uh, I can show you a cleft graft. Yeah, let's just do a, a cleft. Cleft is real simple. Cleft graft is the most simple thing. Uh, it's the one I use the most of, probably. I use it mostly on tea tiny stuff, very tiny stuff. Uh, that's too, literally too small to cut a whipping tongue in. We'll go back to mulberry again. All right. And let me find a tiny mulberry shine. I'm pretty good. I, I'm pretty decent. At I've done so many at cutting a uh, whipping tongue. I'll do them on a little slightly smaller than most people would want. See, that's barely bigger than toothpick size. Just snip that off. I use my thumb protector. This is a cleft graft. I go put my thin blade right in the middle. The same thing, I kind of wiggle that down. I do not force it. You will cut yourself. If now, you try one to of the things it, I've I learned is a typically a grafting knife has a single bevel. Mm -hmm. Now if you're going to try to do a cleft straight down the middle, it's best mm -hmm. to use a, use a double it, beveled it is. type of a blade, now, like you, a razor. If you look at your real grafting knife, made for graft, it has an angle on it. Like a, it's got a, a, a bevel on one side and the other side is flat and smooth. Like a wedge, like a uh, wood chisel, exactly like a wood chisel. And if you cut this way, It'll make the wood curl up away from you and make a curve. If you cut this way, <coughs> it digs down in deeper. All right, that's your traditional grafting knife. That is great, but, and, and you'd like that, but I have found out that having a really, really sharp blade, like these cheap disposable blades, having it really sharp makes up for a lot because your knives need to be literally razor sharp. So I'm using more and more. That's about the same size. So I'm using more and more of these cheap disposable knives. And so I'll cut, cut it on both sides even. Like I said, I've I done a lot. I hardly ever get it just exactly right the first cut. Mulberry buds tend to be far apart. <coughs> that's one, two, three buds, but that's kind of long. I will go down just two buds. About as long as your finger. Too long a sign, the rootstock has to push sap all, all the way up through that sign, remember? So you don't want it too long. About as long as your finger is just right. And you see, I've got just my wedge shape. And I just insert that and split that in the middle there. And try to line it. Again, I am concentrating on lining up that cambium on one side. See, the other side, it doesn't match quite as well. 
but I want to get as perfect a match as I can on one side. If you do a big sign, if you have a big root stock and put a little bitty sign in there, ma same thing, match up the cameo mimosa. If you center that root, the, the sign wood in the middle of a big root stock between the, uh, the cambium layers, there's 0% chance of it taking. But if you, it get will that, not take. if you get that cambium lined up on that one mm -hmm. and the other side where it's not lined up, callus will form mm -hmm. and it'll be seamless the next following it year. It will do it. Now, like, I'm hardly ever making just a perfect graft union. They will heal. That's what I'm saying. If As long as you line the cambium up well on one side, that will heal, that will take, and it will grow over fast. And same thing on this when you have a bark graft. Very different sizes that, that will heal over and this sign wood will heal over that and grow solid in a, uh, within a growing season usually. So it's not a big gaping wound like that. Not for very long, they heal. And once the graft union is healed, it is typically not a weak spot on the tree. Uh, they do not usually break in, in a wind or storm at the graft union if they have time to heal because when they heal, they heal through the bark and cambium and the wood layer all together and it does not make a weak spot. Uh, so grafting is, once they heal good, you know, they're solid. Uh, this right. Is there any other type of graft um, style that the backyard grafter should be aware of? Um, you know, there's lots of them, hundreds. You can invent your own grafting method if you want to. Uh, I, I never had anybody teach me to graft. I learned from a book. Uh, fortunately, uh, I had a good book. It had R.J. Garner's Handbook for Grafters written in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. and, and the opening pages of uh, the Handbook for Grafters, R.J. Garner stresses that uh, any kind of grafting technique you want to use, he calls it mere carpentry. The thing is, you line up the cambium layers, the root stock and sign at the right time of year. Everything else is just carpentry. So you can get as imaginative as you want and do any kind of graft you want, but it, you just have to match up the cambium layer. So I stick with simple stuff. The mm -hmm. cleft graft is straightforward. Split that trunk down the middle and line up the cambium layers. Uh, whip and tongue uh, is more commonly used because that doubles the amount of cambial contact, the, the little Z uh, shape thing in there. And I use a bark graft uh, only really when I got bigger root stock and I had a bunch of tea tiny signs because a lot of my really rare apples and stuff like it, that's the only wood I can get, a uh, tiny one from old mature trees like that. Here's a Virginia wine sap, uh, yellow Hamilton from Alabama. There's a heezy mulberry, a Ukrainian mulberry. See, that's tiny stuff, but that's literally all the wood I had to work with. So I will, I will make a match. The cambium layer has to match on one side. And that is, that is what you gotta focus on. Everything else is just uh, tricks. Well, great. I greatly appreciate the time to teach sure. me and everybody sure. of what you're doing here. And this is invaluable mm -hmm. uh, information that you've shared with us today. Pe people, people think that grafting is some mysterious thing that only a few old farmers do, kind of like witching off warts with a toad or something like <laughs> it or, or using the binding rods to find water or something like it but it is not it is simple uh plant surgery uh if you if your eyesight's good enough to see the cambium layer and your hands are steady enough to hold a, a razor sharp knife you can graft there's uh -huh. just not any more com uh uh there's not any more complexities other than that uh, while we're, let me let me show you we've talked a lot about cambium layer the cambium layer let me show you that because that's important the cambium layer is that layer of light green. See that light green, almost chartreuse just uh, below wood? The bark. It's just below the bark and just above the wood. That is where the healing and the growth occurs in the tree. And there it is, that's cambium layer exposed. That's where your healing and growth occurs. So that's what's important. And it is important to know what that cambium is. Some people have described the cambium layer as almost like um, stem cells those are undifferentiated cells that can either be bark it can be wood it can go on to uh, be mm -hmm. a veining system mm -hmm. limbs it can be anything that it wants to be mm -hmm. so it can be anything that the tree needs it to mm -hmm. be that that makes sense and that's what it seemed like especially this time of year like i said when stuff wanting to grow now's the time to start grafting uh, and it will surprise you the success you get don't be 
I'll tell you what, nobody, no matter how good you are or, or think you are or how many you've done, nobody gets 100% success on grass. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always a gamble. You're taking a chance. Maybe it'll take and grow and maybe it won't. Uh, some years I think I have 100% success on some varieties. I do at first, they'll bud out and leaf out, and then I'll ha I always have a dieback, so I'll lose a certain percentage even after they've leafed out and grown a little bit. You know, so nobody ever gets a hundred percent. And when I first started grafting, I, you know, I was timid. I didn't know much about it. Uh, I didn't know the tricks to it. And I do like ten, and maybe one would take. Well, that's a success, mm -hmm. and I was encouraged by that. <laughs> just having that one take. Uh, oh, you know, I was like, oh wow, you know, that really works. That grafting stuff works. So the next year, I was encouraged and, and did more and did them a little more carefully. With, so now, when you read the book, tricks. when you read the book, it makes sense because now you've mm -hmm. experienced it. Yeah. And you know how to fine tune. Experience helps. It helps to watch somebody actually graft. Like mm -hmm. you can read books. I read books for years before I actually got brave enough to start grafting. Me too. It helps to watch somebody actually do it and really to see how simple it is and straightforward it is. It's simple uh, plant surgery. Yeah. There's not tricks, little tricks and experience help, but they're not necessary. And special tools and special tapes aren't necessary. All right. So go out and, and try some grafts. Well, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having us Thanks. out. Thank Bye. you for sharing everything. And remember, keep growing, keep building, and always keep adventuring. Together, we're Farmington Famous. We'll see you next time.